welcome. Let's look at the first week of development. There are a number of events that occur during the first week of development. Let's go through this lecture to unfold the different activities that occur during the first week of development. In the first week of development, a number of events said occur and activities must be well executed so as to produce healthy baby. These are the activities that occur during the first week of development, which is the first seven days after fertilization have occurred. We've done a lecture on fertilization. You can go and check that up to align with this lecture. So the first event is cleavage. And cleavage is a progressive mitotic division that occur after the formation of zygote. On that cleavage, we have specific activity that also occur, and this is called the morula. Then after this process, we have the formation of blastocysts. So all these processes we need to occur one after the other before we finally have the implantation of the blastocyst. So let's take each of these processes one after the other to see what they entail during the process of development. The first one is cleavage, but the first three days we have early mitotic division of the zygotes, and this tends to increase the number of cells that are formed due to mitotic division. This is the early stage of the cleavage. We have the later stage of the cleavage that will protect the morula, and that will occur on the fourth day. But let's just focus first on the first three days, which is the early phase, and this tends to occur in the first, second, and the third day. This is the female tract, this is the uterus, this is the fallopian tube, a lateral tubular extension of the uterus. And at the terminal end, we have the fimbrae closely related to the ovary. This is the ovary where the egg is produced. So after release, the egg will pass through this canal. And when it gets to this region, that is take the ampulla, this is where fertilization will occur. And this egg will stay and wait for the lucky sperm cell to come and fertilize it. And when the sperm cell arrives, finally it can meet with the egg they will form the zygote and this is the zygote after the formation of the zygote there's going to be the initiation of mitotic division where this single cell that is called the zygote we progressively divide we divide into two cells these two cells we further divide into four cells then we have the four cell dividing into eight cells but if you look at the fallopian tube, you see that the first day is the day where the zygote divides into two, the second day they divide into four, then the third day they divide into eight cells. So you have progressive division. This cell at this point of division are referred to as the blastomia. So the specific name that they are giving is blastomia. So this is the first to the third day. This division tends to be more of fractionating process than a growth process. It if you look at the size of the dividing cell from the first day to the third day, you see that there is no increase in size. Even though there is an increase in the number of cells that is seen, there is no corresponding increase in size. So it's more of a fractionating process whereby the cell will continuously divide, but there is no corresponding increase in size. This is so because this region is still within the fallopian tube. If you look at the first day, the second day, and the third day, they are still within the fallopian tube. So increase in size will not be allowed in this region because the space is limited. The space within the fallopian tube may not be able to provide the corresponding space that is needed for the increment. So there is increase in number of cellular division, but there's no corresponding increase in size. The increase in size will only be accommodated when they finally go back to the uterus where implantation will occur. But at this stage where they are mitotically dividing, there is no increase in size. So we can see that the configuration of the female tracts is presented in such a way that it suits the physiological processes that occur during the development of form. So as this division goes further, there's also compaction, which is the blastomias coming together tightly or are joined by a tight junction. If you look at the eight cell stage, this is the eight cell stage, that's the third day. You see that the cells are loosely packed. They are seen to be connected to one another by gap junction. So as they go further to the 16 cell stage, you see that they are more compacted. The blastomias are tightly gathered up. So this is what we see as they go further. 
Also, at the next stage of development, where they become tight named together, the outline of the cell will become indistinct. You cannot really demarcate the outline of the cell. You see that they are closely packed together. You just see the alignment around their circumference. So this is the kind of presentation that we begin to see. So let's go to the next stage of development. And this is the cell now dividing into 16 cells. So from eight cells that we have in the third day, they will also further divide through mitotic division into 16 cells. And that is the next stage. But this stage is also under cleavage because it's a mitotic division, but it is in the later part. And this is referred to as the morula. So from the 16 cell stage, is referred to as morula. So this is the later part of the cleavage. And this is specifically referred to as the morula. So this is the cysteine cell stage. We remember we said that there's compaction. These cells are now closely packed together. You now begin to see a distinct arrangement where cells are separated into an outer cellular group and an inner cellular group. So you see cells highlighted in red at the circumference, where you see the centrally placed cell highlighted in blue at the center. So the ones highlighted in red at the outside are referred to as the outer cell mass. And this is very easy to capture. Then the one located centrally placed are referred to as the inner cell mass. So you now begin to see, even though they are compacted, the compaction will now create a form of separation of this cell into the outer configuration and the central configuration. So this is the next stage that we would see. And after this, the next stage is the formation of blastocyst. But this is going to be the early phase of the formation of the mature blastocyst. The final structure that will be formed for implantation to occur. We have the early stage. And this early stage, what is specifically seen to occur within this stage is that we have uterine fluid secreted at this stage of development. And what happens is that this fluid will be taken up through the zonal pellucida to penetrate into the inner cell mass. And at this stage, we still have the head shell covering the zygote. So we have fluid penetrating through the zonal pellucida and are seen within the inner cell mass. And this will then create fluid filled spaces within the inner cell mass. And this is the fifth day. This is what is presented. And after this, so what happens to the spaces that are seen within the inner cell mass? So these spaces, they tend to coalesce, come together to form just one single fluid filled space that is called the blastocyst. So we have the spaces that is formed true fluid entering through the zona pellucida coming together to form just a single fluid field cavity. So as they come together, they tend to push the inner cell mass to one side. The final configuration of the mature blastocyst is this is the configuration that they present. You can see the fluid field cavity and you see the inner cell mass that is being pushed to one end. So you have the outer cell mass highlighted in red is now referred to as the trophoblast. When we have the inner cell mass that is being pushed to one end that is referred to as the embryoblast. The trophoblast will form the fetal membrane. That's the membrane that covers the fetus. While the embryoblast will form the entire structure of the human body. So it is this embryoblast that will form the head, the neck, the limbs, and all the structures the body presents. Then you have the blastocyl, which is the fluid that penetrates into the inner cell mass. This is what we need to achieve before implantation can occur. So if this structure is formed, then it means that implantation is ready to occur. But there's also another event that must occur. Remember, we have a sonar pellucida highlighted in black that still covers the head during the process of cleavage, and it covers it up to this point where the inner and the outer cell mass are being segregated. So this shell will need to be removed so that implantation can be enhanced. This has been removed so that implantation can occur. And this process is called action. Action is done to remove the zona pellucida so that the trophoblast will be exposed. These trophoblastic cells that are highlighted in red and surrounding the entire embryoblast is a sticky 
type of cell so that as soon as it gets to the region where implantation will take place, it's going to stick with the endometrium lining of that region. And this will help to facilitate implantation. So on the day seven, which is the final day of the first week of development, we have implantation. Implantation will occur after the mature blastocyst has been formed and also after Action as a code, which is the removal of the zonal pellucida, which is the shell of the egg. We already said that the trophoblasts are sticky in nature, so they will tend to attach fast with the endometrium lining of the uterus so that they can implant onto that region. And this is where the zygote will remain and develop until after delivery is done. Also, to add that the trophoblasts that surrounds the embryo blast, we further divide into two subsets of cells, which are referred to as the syncytiotrophoblast and the cytotrophoblast. The syncytiotrophoblast is more outward, while the cytotrophoblast is more inward. The syncytiotrophoblast, we tend to develop a kind of impression that tends to drive into the endometrium lining of the uterus so that it can further deepen and allow the implantation process to occur. We are going to discuss on the transformation of the trophoblast blastic cells in our subsequent lecture in the embryology series. Just for us to know that we have two subdivisions of the trophoblastic cells, which will be the next line of action that will help to drive these blastocytes into the endometrium lining of the uterus to complete the process of implantation. So how does the uterus also help to prepare for the process of implantation? The uterus does not just lie fallow, it also undergoes some form of transformation so as to assist in the process of implantation. As these processes are going on and the developing zygote is running through this part, there's going to be the proliferation of the endometrium lining of the uterus. The endometrium lining of the uterus is the most internal layer of the uterus, and it tends to proliferate. As it proliferates, there's going to be thickness or increase in its size. So this increase will now give the space for implantation to occur. And this process, of course, is under hormonal influence. Progesterone helps to influence this process which is called the pregnancy hormone, so that the structures that have been planted will have the space to be embedded into. So this is the endometrium lining that has become thickened. So it's good for us to know this, that after fertilization and the formation of zygote is formed, two weeks to that period is called the germinal period and can also be referred to as the period of the zygote. Then follow from the third to the eighth week, we have the embryo period. So at this stage of development, the developing structure is termed the embryo. Then from the ninth week to the point of delivery is referred to as the fortus period. So at this stage of development, the developing structure is referred to as the fortus. So depending on the the level of development, the developing structure is being tagged different names. Clinical anatomy, we we'll talk about ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that occurs when implantation is said to occur outside the uterus. So we said that the normal developmental process after the release of an egg is to get fertilized, form zygotes, and run through the fallopian tube before it's finally implanted into the uterus. After fertilization, the developing zygotes may be redirected backward and be implanted around the infundibulum. It may even go as far as being implanted into the ovary. These are called ectopic pregnancy. Or it runs through the normal part, but did not get to the level of the uterus, get implanted around the isthmus. It is also called ectopic pregnancy. Or maybe it even runs further and gets to the uterus, but also passes the uterus and goes more downward and gets implanted in the cervix. It is also called ectopic pregnancy. So any form of implantation that is seen outside the normal regular uterus, it is termed ectopic pregnancy. And it can occur in the regions or structures that we've highlighted, such as the ovary, the infundibulum, the ampulla region, even where the fertilization occurs, it may decide to stay there and get implanted there, or the isthmus, or even go as far as the cervix, or even the abdominal region. And out of all the number of sites for implantation in ectopic pregnancy, the fallopian tube is the most frequent site where ectopic pregnancy can occur. And this is called the tubal pregnancy. 
And when it does occur, medication, of course, may be enough. But when detected at a later stage, there may be the need for surgery. Let's check our understanding of this lecture through this question. Let's describe the structural transformation that is seen in the first week of development. We've highlighted this in details during the course of this lecture. I'll be expecting your answers in the comment section. So let's meet at the comment section to drive more on this. So thanks for watching this video.